Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, the Senate race heats up as high profile names throw their hat in the ring. Changes in Utah's leadership could have major impacts both nationally and locally. And as campaigns prepare for the general election, candidates race to raise funds and connect with voters. Good evening and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Jason Perry, director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Dennis Romboy, editor and reporter with the Deseret News. Kate Bradshaw, member of the Bountiful City Council, and Chris Blake, partner with RRJ Consulting. So glad you're here this evening. This has been an interesting week in politics. I want to start with something that is sort of emerging here. The chessboard is being set up for the Senate race. Now that Senator Romney has announced that he is not going to run again, we have some names that have announced, some names are about to announce, mm -hmm. and you're all going to get a chance to talk about people who may come forward here in the very near future. Dennis, let's start with you a little bit, because there are some names we know already. For example, Trent Staggs is one of those, and Rod Bird is one of those. Already know that they are on. The mayor of Riverton, Trent Staggs, yeah, Rod Bird from Roosevelt, I believe. Um, not really household names uh, around the mm -hmm. state, uh, but <clears throat> we expect uh, House Speaker Brad Wilson to announce next yeah. week. He's been and having an exploratory committee for months now and has raised over $2 million, including a million dollar loan to his, to his campaign from yeah. himself. So those are some of the names. And then we have others who've not announced who we've just been speculating about, yeah. including Jason Chaffetz and uh, and Representative John Curtis. Yeah. Let's get to a couple of those and see what those paths would look like, Kate, because it's different for all of them. On, on Trent Staggs, uh, he has had some, some people already trying to come to the state. Uh, Carrie Lake was here to help fundraise. Maybe give us a preview for what that means and sort of the path for these names that we don't necessarily know very well yet. Well, so the path is going to be expensive. Um, the election season is already starting, even though we're well ahead of the 2024 election cycle. Candidates will need to decide if they're going to do the signature gathering path or the caucus convention path. Um, the filing has moved up a little bit this uh, this coming year into early January, so that starts the season, you know, just a little bit ahead of where we've been in previous years. Um, if you're, you know, somebody without a lot of name ID, you're going to need to fundraise. Um, so that you can help build that name ID and you may be picking a path that helps you maybe with a more budget conscious path through the caucus convention. Um, but there's still some other names that we expect to come out. Um, you know, Congressman Curtis obviously yeah. has great name ID. Former Congressman Jason Chaffetz um, has some significant name ID. And so those may be helpful factors. Um, there's some other people that I'd love to see uh, perhaps put forward um, their name. Lieutenant Governor Deidre Henderson mm -hmm. is somebody I think is a very intriguing and interesting candidate. And uh, another one that, that would also be worth noting would be uh, Mayor Don Ramsey of South Jordan, mm -hmm. um, who's played a significant role for the Utah League of Cities and Towns over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the interesting things that uh, Utah has not traditionally elevated a sitting congressman to the Senate or a sitting legislator. Th those two have, have always had trouble kind of moving to that next level, wh whatever that might be. And I think we're going to see that broken this year. You obviously have Speaker Wilson, who's come out strong, raised money, is running a very lean campaign, setting himself up for success. Uh, if John Curtis decides to get to get in the race, John is an excellent politician, uh, has a really fervent base that supports him. And so those two would be, I think, would be immediately the front runners. But you could see some others. I know Blake Moore looked at it. Burgess Owens looked at it as as those. And so there, there absolutely is going to be something unique here in that uh, I think we're likely to see somebody elevate from a lower position unless we see that kind of outside business type person come in and get in the race and spend a lot of money, which there's no names, no big names that are out there right now on that. Uh -huh. So uh, it's going to be okay. interesting to see who's going to take the signature gathering route yeah. as opposed just to the convention route. Um, that seemed to differentiate candidates. And I, 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 I suspect we'll have a, a, you know, a fairly 
hefty slate come Republican primary next yeah. year. Uh, Kate, talk about that, because you, you brought it up a moment ago, too. It, it is interesting, because there was a time when, you know, you, when you have a different candidate sometimes coming out of convention than the person that would win. A lot of people, including Congressman Curtis, have opted at, at some point to not get signatures, and I don't know that's going to be a decision he makes again. I, I, how is it playing with people you're talking to? Is it still a big deal if you do or you don't get those signatures in terms of those the more conservative Republicans in the state? If you are a Republican delegate, delegate, then it matters a lot. Um, and Republican delegates um, very much want to see candidates choose only the caucus convention path. They very much believe in that path and process. Um, many uh, elected officials, you know, most state legislators, for example, are actually doing a dual path, especially if you think you might have a challenger within your party. Um, and so I, I expect that you'll see most of the serious candidates consider both paths um, to both signature gather and do the caucus convention. Our state laws allow that. Uh, you know, we have seen a very interesting recent example in our uh, second congressional district Republican primary um, where, uh, you know, Celeste Malloy mm -hmm. came out as the winner of, of the Republican primary, but she was the caucus convention choice, a little bit of a surprise choice. Mm -hmm. Excited to see that happen. It definitely shows that a candidate with less name ID and a modest budget can be successful in that in that arena, and then be successful among um, Republicans as as a as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so those uh, candidates that are looking at this U.S. Senate seat, I'm sure, will be drawing conclusions from this very recent example. I think that's the first time that's happened since we've had the dual path, isn't it? That the convention winner has actually won the election. Uh, John Curtis, his first election was not. Uh, he 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 took the signature route and won the election there. Voters don't seem to care about that as much as as delegates do. Yeah. I think we may have seen Senator Lee at one point also uh, try that path. Uh, Chris, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think it's political malpractice not to go get signatures, and we've seen examples of that on the state house level. Uh, there, there, those folks that have not gone through that yeah. probably probably would have or would have had a much better chance. And so, I agree with Kate. Every serious candidate will go both routes. Uh, you may have some candidates that decide they they don't want to spend the money to go get signatures because it is an expensive proposition, and might go the convention only route and then use that as their selling point. But to Dennis's point, the voters don't care because they want to vote for candidates for Senate, and they're they're going to have those options. Uh, so I think on Wednesday, uh, Kate is when we're going to see this announcement from Speaker Brad Wilson, and he's got a slate of people. It sounds like will be behind him as he does it. I think there will be. He has been on a campaign of meeting with local government officials, quite frankly, for months. Um, so he has been working to hear from um, locally elected officials. He's obviously very popular among um, his colleagues at the State House. Um, you know, we heard recently from the governor that uh, he's a fan uh, as well. Stop just sort of an endorsement, yeah. but uh, has clearly declared that that he was very interested in his. Um, campaign, and he's got a lot of fans among the state Senate as well. So I expect there'll be a robust crowd uh, with Speaker Wilson next week as he makes uh, the announcement that we've all been expecting for many, many months. <laughs> yeah. All that said, I don't know that Utahns really know Brad Wilson, and he'll have an opportunity over the next few months to, to make himself known. I, I don't think that he has that name mm -hmm. recognition as a John Curtis or a Jason Chaffetz might if they decide to get into the race. Yeah, take that up for a second, Chris. You, you are the chief of staff or a speaker of the House. In political circles, we often know exactly who that person is. Does that translate necessarily outside of political circles? No. And that is that is the problem that Speaker Wilson has. I think it. what is impressive that Speaker Wilson has done is both, both raised a lot of money and contributed money. Uh, he has a very successful business career to lean on in addition to his political career which I think has been largely very successful. And so he does have a record to stand on, but he also has money to back that up, and he's going to need it in order to share who he is, what he has, what he has done and accomplished. So before we leave it, Kate, because the name ID and the money, those are two absolutely critical components. And the interesting candidates, candidate we may see in the near future is Congressman John Curtis. I know you're watching, you're talking to a lot of folks about that. Is there a path for him, and how many of these big sort of funders are being locked up already, and when he comes, what does he bring? So John Curtis is an interesting candidate, very popular mayor of Provo before he, he ran for Congress, so he's got a base, um, particularly in, in Utah County, in Provo, and then, of course, in his district. Um, he uh, is well-liked within the state. Um, he, he, you know, he polls well. He would bring, uh, I think, a, a, a national 
fundraising base that is maybe a little bit different from the, the base that Brad Wilson has been pulling from. Um, but you are limited uh, into what uh, people can give in these cycles. Um, you're, you're not able to utilize the same rules we have at the state level. Uh, so Brad Wilson has done a good job of locking up a lot of state level money. Uh, I know he's talking to a lot of these uh, national uh, PACs and other organizations. Um, but John Curtis is a known quantity and has known those people a lot longer. Mm -hmm. uh, we may see other people jump in, including Boyd Matheson, mm -hmm. who's been on our show a couple of times. But one, Dennis, we should talk about for a moment, too, because there's a lot of headlines, is Tim Ballard. Uh, that was a name we're hearing may run a little bit of controversy. Yeah, he comes week. with some serious allegations, um, some baggage, I guess you could say. Um, and I don't know how serious he is about running. Um, he definitely has a base of, of supporters, regardless of any allegations that are uh -huh. pending against him. And he's, you know, even the LDS Church came out and, and made a statement about him, um, which he kind of, uh, you know, questioned whether it was authentic or not. And just there's a lot of controversy swirling uh -huh. around him at this point. Uh -huh. I think one of the interesting things about Tim Ballard prior to the allegations is what is the role of celebrity? I use that term a little bit loosely, but in within mm -hmm. Utah circles, there is a little bit of a celebrity dynamic there, and we see more and more candidates trading on their celebrity in order to get into political office, and we've seen that a lot over the last 15, 20 years, including mm -hmm. President Trump. Uh, but not a great way to s kick off a, a Senate campaign, right? I mean, he, he had A.G. Reyes uh, sort of promoting him without using the name, but it seemed pretty obvious that it was going to be Tim Ballard. And then this last weekend, uh, the, the allegations from the church and some of the news stories, not a great way to start a Senate campaign. It'll be interesting to see if he even sticks around. Yeah. And who may endorse or not endorse now after all this has happened. It's interesting as, as we have these changes, as people are resigning, and, and this past week, well, since we're talking about Speaker Brad Wilson, he announced his resignation, that he will be making an announcement later that we know will be happening on Wednesday. But it changes the dynamic of our House considerably in the state of Utah. And uh, Kate, maybe talk for a moment about that, because we will get a new Speaker of the House in not very, in not very distant future. Talk about the people who are emerging, who are the, at least vying for the position. So the uh, House Majority Caucus will need to pick a new Speaker of the House. Um, they'll do that right here at the end of the year. And there are two candidates that have emerged. Um, the front runner is Representative Mike Schultz, who's currently the House Majority Leader. From Hooper. From Hooper. Um, and uh, he very much is, is, is the front runner mm -hmm. um, in this leadership race. And then uh, Representative Melissa Garf Ballard uh, from North Salt Lake mm -hmm. has announced that she will challenge as well. She's probably the dark horse candidate, uh, a little bit more of an unclear path uh, to victory. Um, Mike Schultz has, has been the majority leader now for several years. He's worked very closely with, uh, with Brad Wilson. Um, you know, he uh, has... Uh, served alongside several other speakers. He, he's, you know, very close with former Speaker Greg Hughes, for example. Uh, so it's probably his race to lose um, in terms of what we expect to see. Uh, you know, that will shake up the entire leadership chain. Yeah. If someone moves at the top, all the other positions, mm -hmm. uh, you know, shuffle around mm -hmm. as well. Um, and so we expect to see, uh, for instance, you know, Jefferson Moss uh, of Lehigh will likely, you know, move into that majority leader uh -huh. spot. Chris, talk about how unique or not this is when you have these leadership elections, maybe just a little bit about how that works, given your experience in the House and what, what it means that, that Schultz is being challenged uh, by Melissa Garth Ballard. Yeah, a couple of things. First, we've had a couple of changes in leadership elections, I believe this is uh, Representative Jeff Moss's uh, fourth year in a row or third year in a row that he'll run for a leadership election, because typically leadership elections in the House and Senate uh, last over the course of the two-year period. So they elect him shortly after the elections, then move forward. But we've had a couple of elections for leadership changes as people have come and gone, and so that, that is a little bit unique here. Um, so I guess maybe it's not unique. Now we're seeing more mm -hmm. changes and more people running. Um, I suspect that Representative Schultz, who has really been viewed as leadership or speaker material from the get-go, uh, he's a hard negotiator, he's invested in the issues, he spends a lot of time, uh, will be a really excellent speaker, and we'll have you know, we'll have a lot of challenges that we're going to see the budget sort of tailing off. And so he's coming in at a time that's going to be a, a real challenge based on what he's he's seen the last uh, the last couple of years. You know, he's known, uh, for instance, for really um, being kind of a caucus leader. 
Um, that's one of the kind of his hallmarks, I think, up at the state capitol. He's very supportive of his caucus. He invests a lot in his mm -hmm. caucus in, in helping them move forward their bills and ideas. Um, you know, he's often helping his caucus negotiate things that they have staked out as caucus positions. And I think, you know, that lends itself clearly to his, his leadership race. And, and I think this is <clears> a hallmark <throat> of Speaker Wilson, who's really tried to focus the legislature. Even this, this week, they were down in St. George, yeah. held their long-term planning conference. He's tried to focus the legislature on, yes, we, we have immediate issues and needs and things that pop up. And the legislature is often very responsive or reactive in that way. But let's look down the road. What are issues that are going to be impactful and how can we solve them or take steps now to move forward? We see that as it relates to the Great Salt Lake, for example. And so it'll be interesting to see how Representative Schultz incorporates some of that, those items that he's learned uh, as he moves forward, because that certainly was a hallmark of Speaker Wilson's uh, tenure as Speaker. Mm -hmm. the, for the sake of the viewers, too, is this this vote, how this happens? Is it, is it secret? Do you know who's voting for you? How does that happen? Because yeah, one people of the don't things, get a look at this things that's interesting, Speaker is a little bit different than the other leadership posts, although the because of the numbers within the, the state House and state Senate, the Republican caucus will gather together and will elect by secret ballot who, who will be Speaker. So you don't actually know who votes for you, and that creates some interesting dynamics and dilemmas. But the Speaker itself will actually be ratified by the entire House on day one of the upcoming session or an upcoming session, because that 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 is the Speaker of the House, and all members get to vote on that person. We saw that, for example, with Kevin McCarthy, who went through multiple votes, the Democrats always voting for Hakeem Jeffries. The State House will do something similar, although uh, I don't believe there's ever been a case where it hasn't been a unanimous vote, mm -hmm. largely because of the numbers here in the state. Yeah. So interesting how that works out. I remember former speakers mm -hmm. saying, I'm, I'm going to go write 30 thank you notes for the 15 votes I got. Exactly. You know, so they just don't know how that works out. Dennis, there are a couple other interesting resignations, uh, people moving out of the legislature. Representative Quinn Cotter from West Valley is, uh, has announced his resignation. Senator Jake Anderegg from Lehigh has announced his resignation as well. Talk about those two things and how this plays with the dynamic. Well, you know, I, I don't know uh, Representative Cotter as well as I know Rep, uh, Senator Anderegg. Um, there's always turnover, it seems like to me, in the legislature. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't always come during, you know, in the middle of an election or in the middle of a session or wh whatever it might be. But, but yeah, that changes the dynamic some. And, and, you know, there's an interesting candidate actually or two uh, looking for to replace uh, Senator Anderegg in, in uh, Becky Lockhart, former Speaker yeah. Becky Lockhart's yeah. daughter, is now running for that uh, yeah. for that Senate seat. Yeah, Emily Lockhart, yeah, daughter of former Speaker yeah. Becky Lockhart. So yeah, so I think that's interesting to, uh -huh. to watch. Uh, let's talk about this other resignation that's going to have pretty significant impacts, and we we talked about the race a little bit here, uh, Kate, but uh, Congressman Stewart. He's, he's officially leaving, and it changes a lot about what's going to happen in the House in Washington, D.C. This is a Utah play that is going to have some, some impacts. Talk about some of those, including a little bit about some of the responsibilities he had that he, we are losing maybe potentially from the state of Utah. Congressman Stewart was uh, the senior member of our delegation, um, so he was he was the keeper of the wisdom uh, of the state in terms of our delegation. And so, w with his resignation, you know, we we lose some of that. Others will need to step up and, and be that senior leader for the state. Um, he held significant committee assignments. When you bring someone new in, obviously that seniority doesn't transfer. You know, they go back to the, being the, the 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 bottom of the seniority list and have to work and climb their way up. Um, the other significant factor is, of course, that. Uh, there are thin margins in the U.S. House, um, you know, nine votes. And with his resignation, they will go to an eight-vote margin. And that becomes particularly relevant right now, this week, um, as budget issues play out and um, whether uh, they will be able to move forward mm -hmm. something that the, um, the, the Republican uh, caucus can, can support or whether they'll have to depend on Democratic votes because now the margin is just yeah. that one vote thinner. Yeah, I want to get to that government shutdown vote and the vote that will be coming up here in just a minute. But before we leave this one, Chris, as someone who does some work lobbying, uh, Congressman Stewart announced uh, recently that he is going to be joining a new lobbying firm in Washington, D.C. called Skyline Capital. Uh, and he's doing this with Robert O'Brien, the former national security advisor to President Trump. Uh, he's made that announcement. Talk about what that means. You know, I, I think it's a, a well-worn path uh, to go from, from Congress to lobbying, and 
I, I won't criticize anyone for that. There are certain rules and obligations that he has to abide by that, including that he can't lobby uh, his former members for up to one year. And so, you know, what he will likely do is what a lot of people do, including former Congressman Jim Matheson, Bob Bennett, a number went this path here, even from Utah, is they will advise companies on what they might look for, what members might be interested in, uh, whether he'll actually ever register to lobby at some point in his career, I guess we'll see. Some do, some don't. Um, but uh, a well-worn path and one that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. hard to fault him for, for doing it if that's what he thinks is best. I know people talk about this, Kate, about that path, which does happen. And as Chris mentioned, there are some ethical rules and that do guide what they can and can't do. I just wanted to read this graphic so our viewers will know how this works, because there are things put in place. And for Congressman uh, Stewart in particular, uh, as he leaves, uh, this is Section 207, imposes a one-year cooling-off period. And this is the rule. A former member may not seek official action from any current member, officer, or employee of either the, the, either the Senate or the House, or, and this is the interesting part, any current employee of any other legislative office. So as Chris mentioned, it's, it's a well-worn path, and the, the playbook is well-known. So for this next year, while he um, serves that cooling off period, he'll be consulting. He won't be talking to, to his former colleagues. Um, but somebody who understands how the game is played from the inside is, is valuable. And so he will be offering that insight to various interests, um, helping them understand who the key players are, helping them refine their message. Um, uh, helping them understand the, the political process, how the sausage is made. And, and so that obviously is, is um, important uh, information and insight. And he may stay in that role as a kind of an outside consultant for a long time. As Chris mentioned, you don't, you know, there's many former elected officials that stay in that role. Or maybe he'll move to the active part where he's up in the hallways mm -hmm. at the U.S. Capitol hanging out in the lobby. That, so. And that might serve him well to not do this lobbying for a year because, he's, as we know, he, he resigned to take care of his wife who had a stroke. And, you know, he told me he doesn't expect to travel a lot uh, in this new position and, you know, to be home more with, with her. Mm -hmm. So that, that might work well for him um, until the, he has the opportunity to, to, to lobby more more, mm -hmm. you know, face to face. Right, right. Well, and one of the other parts that could be interesting, you mentioned Robert O'Brien, former national security advisor to President Trump is joining him or they have some sort of strategic alliance. Uh, Representative Stewart was was often looked at as po a possible secretary of the Air Force, has a military background. So potentially maybe their lobbying or their focus mm -hmm. becomes more on the Pentagon or on national defense sort of issues rather than direct lobbying for Congress. And so I don't know what they have planned, but certainly would make some sense based on his committee background and, and his background in general, what uh, they might be looking at rather than, you know, going up and working the halls of Congress. Right. Uh, uh, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's get to uh, an item that you both mentioned, uh, all three of you mentioned at some point, because we have this looming potential government shutdown coming. The votes will be important on the Republican side in particular, and it has bled into some conversation back home. Uh, the governor weighed in, in fact, this week. Dennis, I want to play this clip from the governor about the government shutdown, and you all can do your prognostications about what's about to happen. This is stupid. I, 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 like, this is the only thing Congress, like, this is the one thing they're supposed to do, right? Like, pass a budget, guys. Uh, uh, like, this is, I, what's it been, 10 years more than that since they've actually done the budgeting process the way it was envisioned to be? Uh, I'm trying to imagine what our state would be like if we acted like this. And uh, we, you know, we get, we get 45 days to pass a budget. The fact that we even have to have this conversation is is deeply troubling to me. Uh, that uh, that we would somehow feel as states, it's our responsibility to to do the one thing that uh, that that Congress is supposed to do. Uh, this is uh, it, it. It should be maddening to uh, to to Americans everywhere. Hey, Dennis. Sounds like the governor saying you had one job. <laughs> Yeah, and, and one job to pass a budget. And our state is good at passing a budget. I mean, it, it's required under the Constitution to, mm -hmm. to, have a, to pass a budget, and it served the state well. I, I think Utah could be a model for, for Congress to follow. Um, that hasn't happened, obviously, and we're facing what, maybe the, is it like the fourth, fourth. Per, par, partial or full shutdown of the government in the past, I don't know, like dec years, dec yeah, decade years, or yeah. whatever it might be. I think Utah is well positioned to maybe handle that uh, as, as we've seen in the past. Yeah, cool, okay. You know, I, I completely agree with the governor. I think he's right on. 
I was a junior in high school the last time that we successfully did the budget process the way it was supposed to happen, and, and I'm a little bit older now. And I, I just find it infuriating. Um, we have obviously a tremendous example in the state of Utah. We have a, a AAA bond rating. We pass a budget every year. It balances. Um, we have uh, healthy reserves. We invest in our infrastructure. Um, I serve in a city that has the highest bond rating we can have for a city of our side. Our reserves are funded. Um, having a balanced budget allows us the, the freedom to, to engage and do other things. Uh, I find it deeply concerning um, on, across the board, uh, nonpartisan criticism on, on each side that it, we cannot do this important uh, work that needs to be done to set our budget um, to help us uh, have a balance to live within our, our means so that we can um, focus on the key things we need to and not on these things that may um, impact mm -hmm. our national parks here in Utah, um, you know, access to Medicaid uh, and a whole host of other services yeah. that we need to have happen. Okay, in our last 60 seconds or so, Chris, I mean, this is important because Kate identifies some pretty big issues, but politics at play. Yeah. Talk about those a little bit and why this deal has not come through. Well, I think you see a number of things, including, I, I mentioned earlier, the role of celebrity. I think what you have is uh, a lot of lawmakers find greater value in being disruptive or becoming celebrities, whether that's appearing on talk shows or whatever it might be, rather than the serious art of legislating, which is and includes passing a budget. Right now, you have an interesting dynamic going on. For example, the whatever we call the, the defense budget did not pass for the first time ever. And you have a maybe a serious discussion about Ukraine as part of that, but there are you know, social issues that are tied up into that budget not passing as well. And they can't even get that budget passed. So this should be very concerning for all Americans that they're not willing to pass a budget and figure this out. But I don't think a lot of these lawmakers are really serious about wanting to pass a budget because it steals from the currency that they value, mm -hmm. uh, which is celebrity or, or popularity or whatever else it might be. Mm -hmm. are, are you are you Tons weigh, weighing in at all on this? Our elected officials, where are they, Dennis, in the last 10, 15 seconds? Uh, I haven't been coming up, so I, so I, I really don't know where they're at, well, other than what the governor said, yes, that, exactly. uh, you know, the state would try to keep the national parks open and try to keep yeah. some of these things going. It's, it's interesting that uh, we're already planning for it. And our governor comes out and says, if it happens, we'll be ready in some way. Thank you so much for your comments this evening. And thank you for watching the Hinkley Report. The show is also available as a podcast on pbsutah.org slash Hinkley Report or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you next week.